Over 20 years ago, in June of 2003, after a rocky start with the album being leaked 10 weeks ahead of time, Radiohead officially released their sixth studio album, Hail to the Thief. The longest album in their discography, clocking in at 56 minutes and 26 seconds, with a total of 14 tracks. It's a very different atmosphere from the previous albums. While Kid A and Amnesiac's sound was much more electronic, experimental, and moody, Hail to the Thief is more energetic, and as Tom York himself put it, sort of a happy sound, relatively speaking for us. The album has a reputation for being politically charged, which is evident in the album's title, which is a reference to a slogan used by anti-Bush protesters in the early 2000s. It's believed that he may have lost the election if Florida was allowed a recount because of the Supreme Court intervening, they weren't allowed to do it, but Bush only won that state by 537 votes, meaning if it was counted incorrectly, his opponent, Al Gore, may have won, hence Bush being a thief. In today's video, I'm going to be taking a look at each of these tracks and see just what they were going for, analyzing the lyrics, talking about how the songs were made, and just the album as a whole. So without further ado, welcome to an analysis of Hail to the Thief. The band's approach for this album was inspired by their touring for Kid A and Amnesiac. They wanted to try and capture how they approached those songs live, considering they were very meticulously crafted studio songs. So this album was recorded that way. In California, which seemed to help, as even though they were recording in September, the sun was still shining, which helped fuel the album's warmer sound. The band got together, and for two weeks they tried to record a song a day, resulting in them analyzing their own work less, which some have criticized saying the album feels like it lacks a sense of direction or feels rushed. I can see where they're coming from, but I think this approach actually helps the record stand out amongst the rest of their discography. It's raw, and feels a lot more casual and accessible compared to some of their other albums. With less time to overthink, they ended up having a lot more fun recording this one than some of their previous stuff. It was like a challenge for them. And on the first day, they recorded the opening track for this album. The opening track for this album has had some lyrics kicking around for a while before release, having You Will Not Put the World to Rights appearing in the text on a page called Little Crocodiles during the Kid A era. The song is more guitar-driven, energetic, and quite a departure from the previous albums, and somewhat reminiscent of OK Computer era Radiohead. Even Colin Greenwood, bassist of the band, said it's got three strong melodies, a loud guitar playing halfway through, a few long choruses, and guitar solos. Isn't that what everyone's been saying they wanted from us? In an interview, Radiohead's drummer Phil Selway said, Each opening track on an album always seems to be the opposite of the overall atmosphere of the last record. So 2 plus 2, I mean, that really fulfills that for us. And, you know, the album is grounded so much more in the performance between the five of us this time than on Kid A and Amnesiac. The fact that you're there and that you're starting up with this guitar just like cranking up at the beginning of it, for us, it's a very unselfconscious way of working, and I think that comes across, especially in 2 plus 2, really. At first, this track was somewhat disregarded by the band, Tom even going on to say, well, that's just a throwaway. It being the first day of them being in California, Nigel Godrich, their producer, wouldn't allow them to eat until they did a test song. So the lyrics were written fast, and everything was done in a bit of a hurry. By the time their session in California was over, they actually listened back to it and they all agreed that it was something special. Tom said that the song was very much them getting out some frustrations and the band really liked it for that. Tom also said that 2 plus 2 was so obviously a sort of statement of intent, but equally in true Radiohead style, totally misleading. The song's title is in reference to 1984 by George Orwell, and the alternate title for the track The Lukewarm being a reference to Dante's Inferno. As Tom put it, the people who don't give a fuck. The lukewarm are on the edge of the inferno, cruising around near the gate, but they can't actually get out. They're like, what are we doing here? We didn't do anything at all. And in Dante's eyes, it's, that's exactly why you're here. You did fuck all. You just let it happen. I think that summarizes the song pretty well. The title is talking about not questioning what you're told, just believing what you're fed because it's comfortable to just go along with it. And with this album being more politically charged, I think it's safe to assume these things Tom is questioning are a commentary on the political state of the world. Most are complacent within society, blind of issues, and by the time people find out, the damage is already done. I try to sing along, but I get it all wrong because I'm not. I swat them like flies, but like flies, the bugs keep coming back. The lyrics here are saying that even if you try to fit in, sing along with the crowd, you'll find it not making sense because they're not right in the first place. 
This album was also released around the time Tom York had his first kid, and because of this he decided to use nursery rhymes and old children's stories to influence his lyrics, and somewhat distill his lyrics to childlike simplicity. Hence the lyrics tell the king the sky is falling in, but it's not, which is a reference to a bedtime story called Chicken Lickin', where an acorn falls on a bird's head convincing them that the sky is falling. A fox offers to take them to the king, only for them to lead them to their den, where the foxes kill the chickens. Once again, showing off blind belief can lead you to your doom. Sit Down, Stand Up, or Snakes and Ladders, the second track on the album is more electronic than the previous, originally with lyrics popping up in 1999, early 2000 on Radiohead's website. Versions of this song were recorded in late 2001, early 2002, but they were a lot slower at the time. The idea of the track was more to focus on the melodies going round and round against each other with less of a focus on the lyrics. The song was tested live a few times, and Tom said they weren't sure what to do with the end of the song. It would always end up with Johnny sitting there on his big ass machine and all the lights flashing while Phil was trying to work out where he'd left the beat. And me and Ed are just like, well, let's just keep singing raindrops and hopefully people will think that it's coherent, even though it's not. And that's basically what they ended up with. The end of the song, when it picks up, was made by cutting up and mixing around what they had recorded, which was originally thought too silly, but Nigel was determined to leave it in. Tom would say that he felt proud of this song, but couldn't remember exactly how they got there, like most things on the record. The lyrics of this song, Tom York described as absorbing what's going on around. There are two or three old songs in there that just never make sense until now, like Sit Down, Stand Up, and I Will. You just absorb. You can't help it, even if you try not to. I tried not to. I desperately tried not to write anything political, anything expressing the deep, profound terror I'm living with day to day. But it's just fucking there, and eventually you have to give it up and let it happen. The main chorus of the song is Tom singing, sit down, stand up. This is said over and over, and is used to represent the kind of control the government has over us, essentially like a big game of Simon Says. The first verse continues with the walk into the jaws of hell. Tom said that he was watching a lot of news at the time and would write down the Orwellian phrases and euphemisms that governments are so fond of. This line in particular is about how they're trying to get people to go to war for them. In the second verse he sings, we can wipe you out anytime, talking on the pure terror that these countries have weaponry that in a push of a button could destroy life as we know it. And for the final part of the song, Tom repeats the raindrops. He repeats this over and over again, which could seem like some kind of metaphor for bombs or something coming from the sky, but as it turns out, he said it was just included because it sounded cool. Sail to the Moon, also known as Brush the Cobwebs Out of the Sky, is a slower track than the previous two. It was made for Tom's son Noah, so this one is much more of a personal track. It is also the first song in the while that really has Tom singing his heart out in it. During Kid A and Amnesiac, he was sick of his voice, hence all the distortion used throughout the two. But now, with Hail to the Thief, he was ready to really get back into it, and this song is evidence of that. When the song was introduced to the band, it was a demo Tom had recorded apparently within five minutes. When asked about the song, Colin Greenwood said, What my brother Johnny says about it is, there are two kinds of song we were working on with Tom. There's the ones which are sort of alright, and you do something that's really good, and then there's ones like Sail to the Moon that, when you hear the demo of it, you could just put that on the record and everyone would swoon. And it's a real case of don't walk in the grass, don't step on the flowers when you're playing it. So you really just try and play as little as possible to get in the way with the tracks, because it's such a delicate sort of thing, such a beautiful thing. The song's timing is something that the band had some trouble with. Tom said it was hard to get it right and everyone had to count the whole time through. Phil Selway even said it's a track that we had quite a bit of difficulty arranging because we can't count beyond four. But in listening it doesn't really sound like it and Tom was really pleased with that. The song is on the longer side but really doesn't have too many lyrics. The first verse, I sucked the moon, I spoke too soon, and how much did it cost? I was dropped from moonbeams and sailed on shooting stars. The first line is actually, I sucked the moon. In old recordings, it sounded like he's saying I sailed the moon, but fans misheard this. And Tom has said in the past during OK Computer, he'd changed some lyrics based on what fans heard from low quality live recordings, so this could be the case here. But the rest of the verse is seemingly about a missed opportunity. 
or false pride. He spoke too soon. He dropped from the moonbeams and sailed on stars, but he didn't make it to the moon. In verse 2, he sings, Maybe you'll be president, but no right from wrong. Or in the flood you'll build an ark and sail us to the moon. This is directly towards Tom's son, saying the possibilities are endless, and he could end up being the best of us. Saying that he could be president, but he'd know right from wrong, unlike those who have been in that position before him. And saying how he could build an ark in a flood, referencing his son's name Noah, and its biblical meaning as in Noah's ark. The song ends with Tom once again singing, Sail Us to the Moon. A hopeful and beautiful ending to this song. Also known as Honeymoon is Over, Backdrifts is another track that's origins can be found earlier in the band's existence. Back during OK Computer, early lyrics to this song could be found on the Radiohead website. The floaty rhythm heard throughout the track was programmed by Tom on a QY70 sequencer. It was made during the band's experimental electronic era, but wouldn't be used for anything until it became the basis for Backdrifts. This track was apparently hard to write, which is why the snippets were seen for such a long time before an official release. Apparently Tom implored the same techniques he used on some Kid A slash Amnesiac tracks where he cut up lines and formed them together. The initial idea of the song is based on imagery noticed when the band was in Japan. Snow was piled high in branches, and then a bullet train would go past and the snow would fall. The world was utterly blanketed except for these straggly bits of black and white, and that's where it started. The words have always been based in that image. He also said, there's lots and lots of different interpretations. I mean, the lyrics are incredibly ambivalent, deliberately, but it sort of came from a certain type of light that I saw, a certain type of smell. It's not particularly anything that, it's sort of basically this pure blind panic, which I kept encountering in various different forms. And that ended up being a song called Backdrifts. It's sort of a fluorescent light. That's probably not very helpful. I can't really explain it. I mean, Backdrifts, to me, ended up being, I mean, if we're talking lyrically, ended up being very much about the slide into, the slide backwards that's happening everywhere you look. There was a time when everybody sort of felt like maybe the world was progressing, and maybe we were getting better, sort of understanding other people, you know? That there was a high level of tolerance and compassion and so on. And then someone literally flicked a switch and the light went out, and everybody just scurried for the dark. That's quite a good way of describing the sort of general atmosphere of that song. The track is about just that, the world slowly falling back into its old ways, it's drifting backwards. The opening verse sings, We're rotten fruit, we're damaged goods, what the hell, we've got nothing more to lose. One more gust and we will probably crumble, we're back drifting. He's saying we're useless, we have nothing to lose and we're fragile. We've been weakened down, we can't try to stop it anymore. In the chorus, Tom sings, we tried, but there was nothing we could do, showing that even with people trying to push against this backwards path we're going down, it doesn't matter. He sings further about this in verse three. All evidence has been buried, all tapes have been erased, but your footsteps give you away, so you're backtracking. Tom is essentially saying they're trying to cover this stuff up. They can remove evidence of wrongdoing to the best of their ability, but with something as simple as a footstep, it still leads to them. But it's okay. You don't have to worry about any of these things. This album was written 20 years ago. Surely these things aren't still a, like a problem or anything, right? Right? Also known as Little Man Being Erased, Go to Sleep is an interesting track. The song is somewhat folksy in the beginning, before becoming a lot heavier towards the end. The track was initially written almost on the spot, lyrically, at least. Tom said the lyrics were tried quite a few different times live, and when recording time came around, he told himself he'd rewrite the song and that the lyrics were placeholder, but it ended up barely changing at all. Colin said that it's got sort of a folksy first half, and then sort of grooves out in the second half, and we had this great sort of 1960s English sort of folk, I don't know, West Coast thing going on. Early Garfunkel first half. It was brilliant, and then we couldn't have an outro. So then we just played it through and recorded it like in one take. And it sounded great, but we sort of lost the first half of the song. What I'm saying is people didn't come into the studio with like, this is how everything should sound. And if it's not going to sound like this, then I'm going to throw my toys out or just freak out or not be happy or, you know, everyone was like, well, if it didn't work out, that's fine because everyone was relaxed about it. We created a space for something unexpected 
and it's good or sometimes better to replace it. I think it's nice to hear how it all came together so naturally. After covering Kid A, Amnesiac, and OK Computer and knowing how those processes were grueling for them, I'm really happy to cover this album which they seem like they all just had a great time recording. The lyrics, like previously stated, just kinda spilled out, but they actually make a pretty coherent story throughout. The song begins with the lines, something for the rag and bone man over my dead body. A rag and bone man was a sort of profession back in the day. They went around collecting unwanted household items to resell. The over my dead body line here is interesting though, as it's usually used in a way to threaten or enforce your ground. But I think in this context and in the next line, it's more of a literal answer. Something big is going to happen over my dead body. Both of these parts end with over my dead body, letting us know that he's somewhat powerless. If they come to take things from him, or if something big happens, he basically has no say in it. Someone's son or someone's daughter over my dead body. This is how I end up sucked in over my dead body. These lines reflect something big from the previous verse, potentially and most likely a war. The lines here are humanizing the soldiers, making it known that they're someone's child. Tom is saying if it was up to him, this kind of stuff wouldn't happen. From here we kick into the chorus. I'm gonna go to sleep and let this wash all over me. These lines are Tom trying to escape, going to sleep and dreaming of a better world. He just wants to avoid it and drift off. In the bridge he sings, we don't really want a monster taking over, tiptoe around, tie him down. Here, Tom is seemingly talking about restricting a power figure who, in his eyes, is a monster. Knowing he is weaker, he needs to be sneaky, tiptoeing and tying them down so they don't have to face the threat. He then sings, we don't want the loonies taking over, tiptoe around, tie him down. Here, Tom could be talking about politicians and their crazy ideals. We don't want someone who is seemingly insane in charge of anything. And once again, because of the power dynamic, he's sneaky about it. Here at the end of the song, a new version of the chorus is sung. May pretty horses come to you as you sleep. I'm gonna go to sleep and let this wash all over me. These lines of the horses are derived from the lullaby, all the pretty horses. In that line, he isn't talking about himself, instead wishing that upon someone else, maybe his child, or maybe the monsters slash loonies he was talking about here. This could be sarcastic, talking on the horrible things that they can do and how at the end of the day, they can go to sleep without a care in the world. <laughs> also known as The Sky Is Falling In, Where I End and You Begin is another track that was floating around for a while, lyrics popping up here and there on the Radiohead website following OK Computer. By the spring of 2001, the almost finished lyrics would pop up on the website under a page called Imaginary Prisons. The track has a great sound, with a killer bass line that drives throughout and was actually made by Tom in the original demo. It's also got some synthy ambience, some distorted guitars, and a great drum groove. Just after OK Computer, Tom York bought a house, and around the time when he moved in, he set up a studio, and an early version of this song was the first thing he did there. The lyrics for this track are interesting, and actually a love song. He begins the song with a verse singing, There's a gap in between, there's a gap where we meet, where I end and where you begin. In an interview, Tom was asked if this song was about the idea of becoming one. His response was, or the opposite. I don't really know what on earth these words mean. I do know I went through a phase where I couldn't actually, where I couldn't get back into my head. I'd walk around and I'd be, I could sort of see myself from above. It's not much fun, I tell you, and the song originally stems from that. Using that information, I feel the song is best understood from the perspective of two versions of yourself living in the same body. One is forced to observe and view everything that's happening, but isn't really in control of any of it. In the next line, he sings, And I'm sorry for us. The dinosaurs roam the earth, the sky turns green, where I end, and where you begin. Here he apologizes for this situation, and then talks of dinosaurs, a reuse of a line from Optimistic off of Kid A. He also talks about the sky being green, probably him talking of pollution. He could also be sort of talking to himself here, arguing with himself. Maybe these two versions can't get along. One wants change and the other is complacent, and the complacent one is using this as a way of saying, well, we can't do anything anyways because of how everything already is. He then sings, I am up in the clouds and I can't come down. I can watch but not take part where I end and where you start, where you, you left me alone. Here he further enforces this idea, saying how he's stuck watching from above and can't escape this purgatory. He's forced to watch, but he can't take part, and even though it's his body, he feels he has no control. His inner self was all alone. 
X will mark the place, like the parting of the waves, like a house falling in the sea. I think here the inner self is trying to fight his way out. Using this imagery as a way to say there's a big event coming. He will find a way out. It's inevitable. With the outro, he sings, I will eat you alive. There'll be no more lies, over and over again. He's sick of being a spectator. He's sick of not being in control. He's sick of the lies he's telling himself he wants to take over. Or maybe this song's about dinosaurs and treasure and that one scene from the series of Unfortunate Events movie that lives in my head constantly. I can't get it out. Please help me. AKA Your Time Is Up, We Suck Young Blood is one of the tracks on this album that was excluded in an alternate track listing that would be posted in 2008 on a social media site Radiohead made called Waste Central. The track is accompanied by I Will and A Punch Up At The Wedding, both of which we will get to soon. This track was described by Tom saying, that song is not meant to be taken seriously, but at the same time it was quite fun, because somewhere in the lyrics it's pretty twisted. Then we break into this freeform jazz nightmare. It's like, come on, lads. Well, it makes me laugh. He also said, that was our take on Hollywood. In fact, we went out to a party, we went to this place, and you people are so silly. And it was like that's how they dressed every day to create an impression. It was brilliant. We felt like old people, or maybe we'd miss something. The song is as they described it, a slow but explosive jazzy track focused on Hollywood. The track begins with piano and bass before Tom starts to sing. Are you hungry? Are you sick? Are you begging for a break? Are you sweet? Are you fresh? Are you strung up by the wrist? Here he's commenting on the condition of some of the people found in Hollywood, and essentially if they're worn out. He continues with, we want young blood. Hollywood wants fresh faces. They want new people being pumped in so they can keep exploiting their naive nature and make money. Are you fracturing? Are you torn at the seams? Would you do anything flea-bitten, moth-eaten? Again, showing off the mental state of the people in this industry, how they're decaying. We suck young blood, we suck young blood. Showing the nature of these people again, exploitation, just after this verse is when it gets all jazzy and crazy. It only lasts for a moment though before cooling down to verse 3. We won't let the creeping ivy, we won't let the nervous bury me. Our veins are thin, our rivers poisoned. This shows how these exploitative practices end up infecting everyone who lives there, even if you try to avoid it. We want the sweet meats, we want the young blood. Again, ending with the need for more. Always taking in fresh faces, the young blood. The Gloaming, also known as Softly Open Your Mouths in the Cold, this track is a standout track on the album as it is in its own way the title track. As Hail to the Thief's alternate title is The Gloaming, and that name was also originally in the run for the album title in general. Originating back during Kid A, The Gloaming was something that ended up being considered for a B-side, but was instead put on the shelf for another time. It would make a small appearance on the Radiohead website here and there like some of the other tracks, but when it was revisited in California during the Hail to the Thief sessions, it was apparently finished rather quickly. The track begins with some kind of bit-crushy sounds dissolving in your ears before the drums kick in, and the synthy melody floats around in your head. Tom sings out in this track, Genie let out of the bottle, it is now the witching hour. Murderers, you're murderers, we are not the same as you. Genie let out of the bottle, funny, haha, funny, how. He's singing about an evil person being on the loose. And with the context of this album, it's probably a politician. The witching hour could be a conflict or something starting, like a war. He comments on these people being murderers. Sure, politicians may not be directly in the battle, but they're still calling the shots. They're the ones sending people to kill and die. We're not like them. We don't want to be like them. When the walls bend, when you're breathing. He repeats this for the first hook. An interpretation for these lines is about how it's terrifying these politicians are even human, that they breathe like we do, that these walls could be some kind of barrier between us. It bends because in some ways, they're like us. They will suck you down to the other side, to the shadows, blue and red, your alarm bells. These politicians are trying to bring you down to their level, using their power and forces to keep us complacent. In the end, he says, they should be ringing, they should be ringing. This is a continuation of the alarm bells line. He's saying these people, how they're acting, what they're doing, should be setting off your instincts. You should realize what's happening and be terrified. We have to do something before they win. 
also known as the Bony King of Nowhere, There There is my favorite song on this album, and definitely a top three for all-time Radiohead songs, along with In Limbo and Jigsaw Falling Into Place. This track is the longest on the album at 5 minutes and 23 seconds, beating out backdrifts by a single second. This track is heavy on the drums throughout, which in recording was done by not only Phil, but Ed O'Brien and Johnny as well. The song builds up to an explosive crescendo with distorted guitars and Tom wailing over top of it. This track was an anomaly for this recording session, as the version done in California has never been released. Instead, a version they recorded back in England after the fact is what made it onto the album. Apparently, the original version had a climax start around the middle point and continue. This was eventually changed to not really kick in until Tom sings We Are Accidents Waiting to Happen. Tom said upon finishing this track, it made me cry when we finished it. Actually, I blubbed my eyes out. Don't know why. I went to LA and Nigel played me the mix and it just made me cry. I was in tears for ages. I just thought it was the best thing we had ever done. He even commented on how it stuck with him. The melody stayed with me for about four months without going away, which for me is really unusual. It doesn't take me long to get bored and I really have never gotten bored of this song. This track was the first from Hail to the Thief to be fully complete, as the version leaked before the official release is practically identical to the final product. The song begins with the drums before Tom starts to sing. In pitch dark, I go walking in your landscape. Broken branches trip me as I speak. These lines are speaking of a conversation, most likely with a loved one or partner. They're trying to trip him up as he speaks. Just cause you feel it doesn't mean it's there. This is one of my favorite Radiohead lyrics ever. It can have a million different interpretations, and I think specifically in the context of this song, it's about them feeling if there's some unspoken issue between the two, or if some kind of trust is being broken. They might feel like something is there, but in reality, maybe it's not. There's always a siren singing you to shipwreck. Steer away from those rocks, we'd be a walking disaster. But in the background, don't reach out being repeated. Sirens in mythology are similar to mermaids. They lure in sailors causing shipwrecks. Here it's used as a warning. Just because you have an attraction to someone doesn't mean it's always the best thing to try and pursue. This could also be that feeling that they have, the feeling that something is there. Maybe this is the siren, trying to ruin everything. He continues with the chorus again, this time adding someone on your shoulder in the background. I think this here is used as the imagery of like the many evil and good versions of yourself telling you what to do. One is saying there's problems, while the other is saying you're imagining it. There, there. A common phrase used to provide comfort or consolation to someone. Here, it's used in a way of saying it'll be alright, despite things probably falling apart. Why so green and lonely? Heaven sent you to me. He's saying they seem off. They're green as if they look ill and lonely, but why? He's here, and they ended up together, so it should be perfect, right? We are accidents waiting to happen. With this outro, they cement that the relationship is going to end. It's going nowhere but down, and will probably end very messy. They're not supposed to be, and it's clear. Also known as No Man's Land, I Will is the shortest track on this record, coming in at just shy of two minutes. This track has some history. It's existed since the post-OK Computer era and was written by Tom after being furious over a situation during the first Gulf War in 1991, where the US military bombed the Amaria bomb shelter, which had over 400 refugees, all women and children. They were all killed by these bombs, leaving these terrifying shadow figures on the walls. It deeply disturbed him and led to this track being written. A version of this track can be heard in Meeting People is Easy during a sound check. The snippet is short, but still has a pretty similar melody to the final version. The track was also heavily worked on during the Kid A sessions and was mentioned several times in the diary Ed O'Brien kept, mostly saying that they had tried some new stuff with it and that they were working on it, but at some point it was shelved. I Will lyrics, like many of the other tracks on this album, would make pop-ups on the site every once in a while. Eventually, it would find its way to Hail to the Thief. Tom said I Will stuck around because of the lyrics, and even after four years, it still felt incredibly relevant. He said, it's sort of like a love song, but it's also sort of the angriest thing I've ever written as well. Because that sort of anger 
that you can't even begin to express. This thing about you can do anything to me, but if you come after my family, I will kill you. Despite the lyrics being angry, the instruments for this song are soft and simple, just guitars and Tom's voice. I will lay me down in a bunker underground. I won't let this happen to my children. Meet the real world coming out of your shell with white elephants sitting ducks. It's clear how inspired these lyrics are to that event. He speaks on that rage he mentioned in the interview. He wouldn't let this happen to his family. He's showing how awful the world can be when you're not in your bubble. He ends the verse with, I will rise up. He wants a revolution, a change. He then sings the outro, little baby's eyes, 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 giving imagery to the kind of people who were hurt in these senseless killings, innocent children who had to endure these horrors enacted by politicians thousands of miles away. It's understandable how Tom views this as his angriest song. With the final line sung, the guitar plays directly leading into a punch up at a wedding also known as no 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 what a beautiful title radiohead thank you this track was inspired by a negative review of a live performance done on july 7th of 2001 in radiohead's hometown of oxford it hit tom as the show he had viewed as a great moment for the band and now the memory was tainted an early version of the song was performed live in the summer of 2002 with the early lyrics being written down on a piece of paper since Tom hadn't quite memorized them yet. These very early lyrics have some lines like, you used to be alright, what happened, which we would later see in the track 15 Step, Off in Rainbows. Later in the tour, lyrics come closer to the final version would be sung, with an extra chorus that would be cut from the final version. The title and some lyrics were derived from Tom listening to a radio station that spoke on a riot breaking out at a wedding and Tom was thinking that it was supposed to be the biggest day of their lives, and it was just being ruined. I basically don't read anything that anybody writes about us now, at all, because I just can't anymore. And the main reason for that was that I happened upon, sort of by accident basically, a review of our Oxford gig, which was just like, I mean, one of the biggest days of my life, obviously for all of us, and this, whoever this person was, just tore it to shreds and they couldn't really think of how to tear us to shreds, really, so they just tore the audience to shreds and just basically said, who are these people, a bunch of students, you know, white middle class, which was not the case at all, but what's the point in arguing? But this person managed to totally and utterly ruin that day for me. The intro to the song is Tom saying no, like, a lot, 42 times to be exact, used as maybe an ad lib or perhaps an internal monologue at the review that he read. He then sings... I don't know why you bother. Nothing's ever good enough for you. I was there. It wasn't like that. You've come here just to start a fight. He's talking about how the reviewer is uh, basically just talking mad shit, and Tom is sick of it. That dude's just there to stir up trouble. You had to piss on our parade. You had to shred our big day. You had to ruin it for all concerned in a drunken punch-up at a wedding. He's further showing how much of an asshole this reviewer is, ruining a day they were so excited for with no concern for the consequences, and then comparing it to a fight at a wedding, a big disaster in the middle of what should be an incredible day for these people. Hypocrite opportunist, don't infect me with your poison. A bully in a china shop, when I turn round you stay frozen to the spot. He's again even further shitting on the reviewer, saying he is talking all this shit, but when he's confronted he's frozen and acts like he didn't do anything. The pointless snide remarks of hammerhead sharks, the pot will call the kettle black. It's a drunken punch up at a wedding. Here he's saying everything this reviewer does is pointless. He calls out things he thinks are bad despite it being his fault and maybe bad in the first place, essentially complaining to complain. Tom ends the song once again by saying no a shit ton, this time 65 times if I count correctly. Admittedly, this song isn't my favorite, it's just never really clicked with me for some reason, but it does have some cool ideas sonically. I will say, however, I am a big fan of... AKA Judge, Jury, and Executioner, Mixomatosis is another favorite of mine. It's probably one of the noisiest Radiohead tracks, and it just tickles the right part of my brain. This track had lyrics floating around for a bit, as it originated as sort of a short story that Tom wrote. It was cut up and used for the old line out of a hat trick when he was writing lyrics for Kid A, but later saved for this. The title comes from a disease for rabbits. It was specifically deadly for European rabbits. 
The virus was a prime example of disease hopping species, and it has been studied extensively because of this. It's a virus that <clears throat> essentially strips the ability to host antiviral immune mechanisms. Its symptoms include swelling at the site of infection, fever, swelling of eyelids, face, base of ears, skin lesions, nasal discharge, respiratory distress, hypothermia, and death. Oh, Tom specifically chose to use this as the title because the name of the disease got stuck in his head. He just thought it was a cool word. I remember my parents pointing out all the dead rabbits on the side of the road when I was a kid. I didn't know that much about the virus or even how to spell it, but I loved the word. I loved the way it sounded. The song is actually about mind control. I'm sure you've experienced situations where you've had your ideas edited or rewritten because they didn't conveniently fit into somebody else's agenda. And then, when someone asks you about those ideas later, you can't even argue with them because now your idea exists in that edited form. To me, that's part of what myxomatosis is about. It's about wishing that all the people who tell you that you're crazy were actually right. That would make life so much easier. The mongrel cat came home, holding half a head, proceeded to show it off to all his newfound friends. Tom begins this story by comparing this person to a cat, one that brings home little prizes to show off his worth. He then sings, I've been where I liked, I slept with who I liked, she ate me up for breakfast, she screwed me in a vice, but now. He continues saying, he can do what he wants, sleep with who he wants, he has nothing to hold him down. But in the first instance of adversity, this person who screwed him in a vice has left him feeling, I don't know why I feel so tongue-tied. He's at a loss for words, he can't communicate properly, and he's stuck. I sat in the cupboard and wrote it down in need. They were cheering and waving, cheering and waving, twitching and salivating, like with myxomatosis. Here it seems Tom is reflecting on experiences, writing songs, how it, everyone seemed to love them, but how it seems to have some kind of dark meaning underneath. He continues, But it got edited, fucked up, strangled, beaten up, used in a photo in Time magazine, buried in a burning black hole in Devon. Here he's talking about how things he does may be misconstrued by the media, his intentions could be warped, making it seem like he did one thing despite never that being his intention. He again sings the chorus, now adding on, I don't know why I feel so tongue-tied. Don't know why I feel so skinned alive. He feels naked. He's exposed. My thoughts are misguided and a little naive. I twitch and I salivate like with myxomatosis. You should put me in a home or you should put me down. I got myxomatosis. He's misguided. He feels like he must have some kind of disease because he doesn't feel right. He needs help. Yeah, no one likes a smartass, but we all like stars. Wait, that wasn't my intention. I did it for a reason. It must have got mixed up, strangled, beaten up. I got myxomatosis. Here he's reflecting on his fame and how he said he doesn't want to be famous. But when you're famous, you get money and you get used to it. The fame wasn't his intention along the way, but he feels like it was changed. He feels like some disease took over and made him do this. He again ends with the chorus, saying how he still feels like he can't speak, like he can't say what he wants. And then, after this heavy-hitting, energetic track, aka As Dead As Leaves, Scatterbrain is another slower track on the album. Tom described it as the loneliest song on the album, and as Johnny put it, it's a very simple and sort of quite pretty, but there's something about the music for me, the chords for me, where it never quite resolves. It's never, it never really grounds or something never grounds itself. So it just sounds like it's always about to resolve and in a way it never does. It makes it quite floaty. The lyrics only further push this sound. Tom uses them to sort of describe his mind as if it's a landscape. I'm walking out in a force 10 gale birds thrown around, bullets for hail. The roof is pulling off by its fingernails. Your voice is rapping on my windowsill. He starts saying he feels like he's surrounded by the white noise of the wind, things darting around. It's a mess, and still all through that remains some memories in there. He continues to describe this. Yesterday's headlines blown by the wind. Yesterday's people end up scatterbrained there. Any fool can easy pick a hole. I only wish I could fall in a moving target in a firing range. More memories pass, headlines, old faces. He speaks on how any memory could send him down a spiral of emotions and other memories. He feels like he's a target because of how his brain is throwing everything at him. And then in the outro, he sings, somewhere I'm not scatterbrained. 
Somewhere I'm not scatterbrained. Lightning fuse, powers out, scatterbrain. He wishes he could be present in the moment instead of in his head all the time. He wants to be present. These lyrics somewhat calling back on those feelings felt and where I end and you begin of not being present in the moment, not feeling like you're really there. AKA It Girl Ragdoll. A Wolf at the Door is the closing track of the album and another one of my favorites. It's a song that has been floating around since Kid A and has lyrics featured on the Radiohead website several times during that era. After some attempts to record it, it was reconsidered for Hail to the Thief. And while it was finished, it almost didn't make it onto the final album track list as it was more realistic, angry, dark, and had violent imagery in the lyrics that were unlike other songs on the album that played more with the fairy tale nursery rhyme theme the album has. I'd argue it still ends up in the same vibe though, as rather than using the lyrics, the instrumentation is more of the catalyst for that childlike sound. And I mean the lyrics do talk about a big bad wolf trying to break down the door and I think that's pretty, you know, fairy tale esque already. It is also the first time Tom has ever taken a spoken word like approach to a song, and it ends up mixing pretty well with the overall atmosphere of the track. When asked about it, Johnny Greenwood said, it's a beautiful song, and then he starts shouting, dance you fucker, flan in the face. I mean, fantastic, but what's he on about? The lyrics in this song are extensive, as Tom doing this spoken word style allows him to get his vocals out quite quickly. This whole verse is used as basically a rant, with lines like, smacks you in the head, knifes you in the neck, kicks you in the teeth, steel toe caps, are used to show the violence of this person. And lines like this, don't look in the mirror at the face you don't recognize, help me call the doctor, put me inside, are shown to use the deterioration of our narrator's mind. In the chorus he sings, I keep the wolf from the door but he calls me up, calls me on the phone, tells me all the way he's gonna mess me up, steal all my children if I don't pay the ransom and I'll never see them again if I squeal to the cops. This is where the fairy tale villain of the wolf appears, here representing essentially capitalism. The wolf wants his money, his contribution, and if he refuses to pay up he's gonna take everything he has away, like it's a ransom. He can't squeal to the cops because, well, they wouldn't help him anyways. In the bridge, Tom again sings no, a lot. And then for the next verse, another big chunk. Here further instilling that capitalist notion, investments in dealers, city boys unaware people are even poor because of a class division, how everyone in the lower class is essentially born and raised just to do a menial job to make ends meet, rarely having a chance to even escape their class boundaries. He repeats the chorus again, now adding, and I'll never see them again if I squeal to the cops, so I'm just gonna, and then he howls, like a wolf. He blends in because he has to, or he'll lose everything. And there, the album ends. After one hell of a closer, the album's over. The album is full of political imagery and themes, and unfortunately, not so surprisingly at all, a lot of these still hold up in our society today. It's been almost 20 years since this album's release and I think it still holds up as a great Radiohead record. It has stood some criticism for being too long or being too cluttered, but I think there's some really fantastic tracks that are some of Radiohead's best. I do think it suffers from the issue that Amnesiac had where there's some tracks that are really, really good and then some that are just good, but not like, you know, up here. So it makes these look lower because these ones are so high you know they're really really good so it's hard to it's hard to stay keep up basically i may not listen to this album fully through that much but i do listen to a lot of the tracks individually songs like two plus two mixamatosis they're there scatterbrained wolf at the door are all tracks that i go back to pretty regularly i really find this album to be an underrated entry in radiohead's discography i feel like every other album has some sort of talking point around it and Hail to the Thief is just kind of there. Pablo Honey, of course, has Creep. Uh, the Benz has, I mean, it's just an essential 90s album. OK Computer is obviously regarded as one of their best and also regarded as just one of the best albums ever. You know, Kid A is, is labeled as this big turn for the band. Amnesiac has the talking point of it being Kid A B-sides. <laughs> in Rainbows is, I mean, In Rainbows, look at that thing. Look at it, it's beautiful. Uh, love you in rainbows king of limbs is often talked about as being like 
their weakest album in their discography or people arguing over from the basement version being better. Uh, and a moon-shaped pool is just a modern masterpiece. I feel like Hail to the Thief ends up sort of being a middle child for the band where it's just sort of ignored. Um, and uh, and I, I don't know. I feel like people are sort of missing out on it. I think I think you guys should go take another listen to it, really, if you if you don't think about this one too much. So so do yourself a favor. Go listen to this thing. This has been Stemp. Thank you guys for watching. And this concludes an analysis to Hail to the Thief. Thank <laughs> you.